This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange, the podcast of me and luckily for all of us, also Arthur Parkinson today. And I've managed to persuade Arthur to come back for a few as we end the year and then he'll be with us much more next year in 2024. So isn't that great news? Certainly for me and I know for all of you. So welcome, Arthur. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Um, Today we thought we would talk about the things that we are planting this autumn mainly bulbs but a few perennials and roses which just have kind of piqued our interest more than other things I suppose so the sort of highlights of our autumn range really and uh, the things that we really are very keen to include in our gardens for next year. So Arthur will you will you kick us off with uh, one or two things? Yes I'm very excited because I saw it in your rhubarb bed must be nearly two years ago now. Um, yes. It's a whopper of a goblet tulip in the most gorgeous goldfish orange and then with a green like little fleck on its under petals, it's orange marmalade. And there's a wonderful photo of you holding a huge bunch of it, like yeah. uh, their croquet heads. And I think it's their perennial, isn't it, too? Very perennial because it's in the Viridifloras, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's cloudy, isn't it? And like you know, it's the first like proper orange one that you've found in it that group. It is, and it's huge. It's got really huge heads, and that that isn't always lovely. But actually, because it has the green in it, mm. the Viridiflora, sort of characteristic, sort of half the petal being green as well as orange. You know, with the orange, it feels uh, very sort of subtle and beautiful, even though yeah. it's showy. And so for me, orange marmalade, I, I would say, is definitely shot straight to uh, one of my top 10. I think it's mm. an absolutely cracking tulip. And actually, that that takes me on to my number one on my list, which is a brand new tulip, uh, which is called Campbell. And we were sent uh. it to trial. And we were sent it as a double development of the tulip ballerina, which, as everyone will know who's listened to the podcast, is the most incredibly elegant so-called lily flowered variety. So it's got the pointy petals, but also it has the most beautiful freesia scent. And it turns out that Campbell that has been bred from ballerina is actually a double, but is also scented. And so it's got kind of everything going for it because any double tulip lasts longer on the stem in the garden in a pot and in the vase because it's sterile, so it holds on to its petals longer because it doesn't get fertilized, but also it's perfumed. And Mm. it's uh, we haven't trod it for long enough, but I have a hunch that it's going to turn out to be very perennial. So it's a really exciting new development. There aren't that often, unlike dahlias, there aren't that often new tulips that just blow me away um, because they feel like just a sort of very minor variation of something that I've seen before. But Campbell is genuinely absolutely brand new. And as Orange Marmalade was a couple of years ago, it, it just completely, it, it was absolutely at the top of my list from the moment I saw it. Yeah, and it's 10 centimetres shorter than Ballerina, it says. So I'm guessing they look very good together in a in a pot. Yeah, that's such mm. a nice idea. And uh, it flower, It will flower longer probably than ballerina, but ballerina is yeah. one of the longest flowering of the Viridifloras anyway. So I think those definitely are really precious new tulips. And I'd have to add to that a collection that I put together with you, I think. Yeah, last, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, last spring, and it's the ginger snap tulip mix. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about this because... There's an incredible place in Holland that I passionately recommend and have in the past, but I would like to again, which is quite near Schiphol Airport. And so it's in sort of central Holland and it's called Hortus Barborum. And 
it's this, it's basically a living museum of spring flowering bulbs. So what I mean by that is rather than the bulbs of every variety that's ever been growing being stored in a, in a kind of fridge, they're actually grown out because it makes them healthier. So a proportion of the collection is grown out every year. And it's a very exciting place. I mean, sometimes I find it quite frustrating because it's like being taken to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory's factory, <laughs> but you're not allowed to eat anything <laughs> in that. <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of the varieties, of course, are no longer available. So it whets your appetite, but you're like, oh, no, you can't get them to grow. But what I now try and do is I try and go there for inspiration because it's unbelievably beautiful. And I, I really, there's a beautiful, absolutely classic Dutch church in the background of the field. And it's just the most lovely place. But it was there that I discovered um, what's called the breeder tulips. And a lot of the, this tulip family, which are, I'm afraid, all no longer available, really tragically, but a lot of them are brown, mahogany, uh, crimson, really rich, the color of a sort of, you know, a, a, a conker or a chestnut, some of them. And they're just so unusual and so sophisticated. I was completely blown away by them. And I put together this brandy snap tulip mix um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And then one by one, they became unavailable. And it was just so sad because we had to scrap the collection. So last year, you and I put together this new collection, mm. which is as like it as you'll ever get. And uh, it's yeah, it's got those same sort of very muted sort of faded tapestry tones that I think is so lovely with a little bit of purpleness through it from Blue Parrot. So that is is absolutely a stormtrooper success for me. I just absolutely adore it. Yeah, I remember us putting that bunch together and it's it's lovely to see the photo now because we did the Willow Crosley technique, didn't we, with Ridgetail in, in some of them on the yes. photograph where we just gently peeled back yeah. a few of the petals to open them up. Yeah. And they really do become the most, just more flamboyant, but classic looking like Venetian tapestry creatures. And it's lovely that we've got a collection with Blue Parrot in finally, because yeah. Blue Parrot's been mm. on the block a while, hasn't it? But we've yeah. not used it that much. And here it just it just worked, didn't it? It was the smokiness, but then the, the clout of Cairo and yeah. yeah. And then Continental's exciting too, because that reminds me of Queen of the Night, but it's it's yeah. a little bit more rich, isn't it, than just going into the black shades. Yes, it is. And I mean, Queen of Night is a really good tulip, but Continental with us just seems to be that bit much more perennial. So, Oh, does it? Yeah, oh. that's why we've, I mean, it's been coming up here for 10 years now. Mm. And what, what next on your, what you're going to be planting list? Well, the thing the thing that I'm going crazy for bulb wise aren't aren't tulips or all or narcissa actually in in terms of pots in the garden it's it's lilies because this mm. this summer I've just loved them and um, yeah. they're they're perennial in pots too yeah and, and I love this everlasting lilies collection that we did it's so the shapes are so beautiful and the contrast of of black beauty with the orange of Henry is is so just vivid and circus like. And um, as, as I've said, in pots, they're happy. The deeper pot, the better. And they'll be coming yeah. back for years. And if you're doing them in the ground, just add grit and, and they'll be really happy. So I, I just I just love lilies, really. I think they're so characterful and arching. And people worry about lily beetle, but the later lilies, these later flowering ones, which flower in August and September, which are mm. these um, Henry Eye and um, Black Beauty, I mean, we very, very rarely get a problem with lily beetle on these late flowering ones. That's why we've moved to them more and more. And yeah. it's, it's definitely the case that the ones that we have more of a problem with are the regales, which I absolutely adore, but they're sort of June flowering. But I have to say, I don't know if other people have found this, but we definitely have got a really decreasing problem with lily beetle. And the last two years, and touch 25 pieces of wood, it's much, much rarer for us to see lily beetle or their horrible grubs. And um, so I'm hoping that the tide has turned. And I don't know if it's because we've got so many garden birds here now, but I always thought one of the reasons that lily beetle was scarlet was to put birds off eating them because it was sort of saying I'm toxic. But certainly our lily beetle population has completely crashed. So I, I wonder whether that's a general experience of, of, of lots of gardeners or whether it's just specific to here. So I'd love to know about that. Mm. So my next one, 
sort of related actually to lilies are the fritillaries. And I have just loved those this year, this spring. I, I mean, they are really expensive to buy initially, but they're incredibly perennial. I went to see my mum and her garden in the spring, and there are still imperial fritillaries coming up when my parents planted them 50 years ago. And they honestly are the most perennial bulb I've ever seen. They're like a peony and a noreen. They just get better and better year on year. So they feel like a big outlay, but you'll never not have them, if you see what I mean. And what we tend to do is put them in a pot for maybe two or three years and then transplant the whole clump straight into a dappled shady spot in the garden, which is where they would grow naturally. And I absolutely adore Imperialis early sensation, which is a green imperial fritillary. And it genuinely flowers in March. And you could even precede that with Radiana, which we have in flower here really pretty reliably by the end of February. And so they're these harbingers of spring, but of such glamour. You know, they look like incredible sort of flamingos walking into your garden before almost anything else has started to flower properly. So I'm definitely encouraging uh, Josie and I to put more uh, fritillaries. And we just try and put a few in each year so that we gradually build up the number because they are pricey, but uh, they will not disappear. They won't get any. Well, they can get lily beetle, of course. So you've got to keep an eye out for that but they're basically very pest and disease free. For me, they're one of the most exciting bulbs that we've got in increasing numbers at Perch Hill. I, I grew them quite early on by the door and my mum um, yeah. forbid me to do them again because um, I think by the door they are a little bit pungent, aren't they? Uh, they, <laughs> well, they, yeah, can be. they can be. I don't know if your newer varieties mm. are less, less pungent than the classic ones. I mean, this was 10 years ago. Uh, do you know, I think they are, but yeah. I mean, I haven't done a, a pong test. Because you have them by your door and I have to say I've not, I've, I've, I thought last year, I thought, well, Sarah's aren't smelling, so maybe it's been something that they've been conscious of in the in the breeding, hopefully. Yes, mm. maybe. Yeah. yeah. So what would be your next one? Um, I'm loving this very delicate little new Muscari collection you've done mm. because I just love Muscari because they're, they're brilliant weed suppressants, aren't they? For yeah. anyone who, you know, if you're thinking about turning your front garden into like somewhere you can park your car, it would be a perfect bulb to introduce into that kind of scenario and i also love the fact that if you haven't concreted between the cracks in your slabs yes. you can get them to self-seed in fact this this autumn i'm going to cheat and chisel away some larger cracks and plant the muscari bulbs in between because i just i'm in love with i think it's clive clive nichols who took that incredible photo of a terrace somewhere that's mm. full of muscari it appears in country life magazine every now and again and um i just love that i'm in love with that so i'm going to try and get a few muscari bulbs. I'm going to chuck them onto the the paving, and and Great. try and plant them where they land in nooks and crannies to try and cheat a little bit because I think that looks so romantic. And the bees love them. They're a brilliant cut flower actually. And the seed heads are almost as good, aren't they? Definitely. And the foliage, the foliage in some of them can be quite big, but this this new collection looks quite finely leaved to me. So yeah, I'm looking forward to those. Good. So I'm going to move. I know you said you weren't planting Narcissa. I, I've got to. Um, oh, no, rave. I am. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> well, I've got to rave about one at least before we finish. And that's because one of the things that keeps my umbrella afloat, if you see what I mean in gardening, is trialing and testing. And it's that there are new things uh, uh, sort of coming into one's sight line every year. And I would say the thing that blew me away more than anything this spring was a new Narcissus and it was a whole series of them, but it's the Starlight series. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, the Sensation series. And Starlight Sensation was the one that I just thought was absolutely incredible. And it was so late to the party that it actually didn't even make it into the catalogue, but it, but it is, we have got it online, but it's just, I, I can't tell you how good it was. So it flowers all the way through from the middle of March until the end of April. So it flowers for ages, which is really, really fantastic and unusual with a narcissus or a daffodil, but it smells completely incredible. So mm -hmm. it really has a Stephanosi scent. But the thing that made it totally outstanding above almost any daff I've ever grown, I think, was the number of flowers per stem. So 
I mean, we were counting them and there were sort of eight or nine flowers per stem. So you only wow. needed, and each bulb had several of those stems. So you really only needed five bulbs in a pot to give you the most incredible show. And so just in terms of value of length of flowering, perfume factory and, you know, floweriness per bulb was just totally and utterly exceptional. So that would be my last bulb that I just, um, I really, really didn't want to pass over uh, before we move on to a few other things perhaps. But yeah, just for me, completely amazing. Yeah, I'm planting tons of narcissi because I've got a new a new chicken land to cotswold up. Try and copy your your chicken pen. So I'm oh, going to be planting that's lots. So good. Yeah, <laughs> T- tell us a little bit about that. So um, it's it's rented land, and um, I'm rehoming ex Waitrose Blue egg layers. <laughs> so um, hopefully wow. by next spring, if I can get my act together, I'll I'll have lots of narcissi for them to wander through. And look very Cotswold country life, whatever you want to call it. Um, oh, nice. But do you, with your narcissi perch, do you add anything when you're planting them, or is it just straight into the ground with a ball planter? No, it, because we're on very heavy clay. I would just put a handful of either spent compost or yeah. even grit in the bottom of the hole. Mm. And I do use, I use a bulb planter or a actually even a potato tuber planter. Yeah. Uh, depending on the size of the of the bulb. And so I'll just take a core out and plop it in. I mean, I mm. say I. I mean, I am really not necessarily telling the truth because, of course, we plant so many bulbs here. It is really the whole team of gardeners here. Once we get into October, October and November is bulb, 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 bulb planting time. And even into December with our tulips, it's, it's really... but And we're all... We're... We're all female gardeners here, bar one. And um, it's quite tiring. It's quite exhausting. I'm not saying uh, the females are the weaker race, but um, we we all certainly find it quite physical, but very, very good for our health. But um, yeah, bulb planters really help the old back, I have to say. Mm. Um, so the ones that look like a spade with the sort of tube coming off the end. So you take a core of... So that's how I planted them into the chicken run here. Right. Well, I will copy you then into stony, horrible Cotswold soil. That'll oh, be yes. fun. <laughs> uh, so, any any final non bulb thing, Arthur? That you yeah, wanted I've got quite to a few. Okay, you go for it. I mean, I'm so excited by this kitchen garden s- spread, which you'll find ridiculous because I'm famously not the edible person. But I'll let you mention something else because I think you'll you'll enjoy mentioning that what's on this page. But for me, my favourite big pots this year. We bought them last year actually to honour the the Queen dying because I had a very upset partner. So mm. we went to a garden centre and we bought two of these plants, Little Miss Figgy, which is yes. a gorgeous fig. Mm. And they really have the most, they've grown into like wonderful Christmas bauble shapes. We've got them in quite big pots, but then they've not fruited this year, but you know, they're quite young. But the leaves and the the proper clout they're giving the garden in terms of foliage, I, I love. And um, I think next year we will get fruit off them. But they're wonderful, you know, my, my dad's got brown turkey in a pot and it's literally just been like a giraffe and gone straight up and doesn't really look that elegant. But these are are proper, like, designed for, to grow in big pots and they make lovely shapes. So um, I'm definitely going to get some more of those. Good. Okay, well, my final one for autumn planting is rhubarb. And uh, I don't know, I just love rhubarb. So I, I think it's one of the most incredible edible crops because it looks good. It thrives in dapple shade. It honestly doesn't mind where it lives or grows. And the more you pick, the more it crops. And so every year I try and plant a few crowns of rhubarb because uh, we just pick it, you know, not quite year round, of course, but certainly for six months of the year. And the best time to plant it is sort of October, November time. And so now, you know, autumn planting is really, really successful. You can actually start planting earlier. Plant it into loads of good muck so it's really, really hungry. And don't pick it in its first year or perhaps even its second. But the good thing is the ones that we send out is they're actually two-year-old crowns already. So you should be able to leave it for one year and not harvest. But in the following season... So sort of 80 months after you've planted it, you should be able to pick, 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 pick. And I holiday on the west coast of Scotland 
an eye pick from rhubarb that was planted in 1856 in a wool garden that was wow. planted, I know, in 1850. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and there are two things that come up, and it's rhubarb and narcissus. And honestly, they were planted by a, a gardener in this wool garden for a big sort of large house that's now gone, was burnt down. The house is gone, but the rhubarb and the narcissus <laughs> still come up. Like, like phoenixes. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. And so that, for me, is something I always try and plant every autumn. So rhubarb and narcissus have to be a bit of a must. Thank you, Arthur. Is there anything else that, I mean, well, I just... Well, I, I must just triumph your, your peak-free compost, which I know you've uh, been working on to bring out for a while. And... It's so interesting, the, the issue at the moment with compost. I, I needed compost, ordered some, next day delivery off, you know where it came. I've got foxgloves that literally have not grown an inch. Mm. Um, but you, I know, have cracked the the recipe, I think, through endless trials with, with Josie literally at Perch Hill, bless her. You know, she yeah. must have wasted so many lovely seed seedlings, planting them into compost that wasn't wasn't the ticket. But I think this this new one is is the ticket. And I think it's really good value, actually. Um, oh, as well good. so yeah. well done and, and we have tried it with bulbs mm. and for containers for the summer and what I w what we have found uh, with our peat free mix is that the containers need a bit of a boost once you hit July so we, yeah. we, we actually put a slow release granular organic fertilizer like a potash a granular potash or something just to give a bit of supplement you know you can't just do it and then expect the pots to feed themselves if you sort of mean hmm. but apart from that that's the only extra requirement that we found and for tulips and narcissus interpots it, it has worked unbelievably well and all our forced bulbs so all our hyacinths amaryllis paper whites are all were trialed over the last five years uh, and planted into it and they're all going out in this peat free mix and because it was such a success so i feel really proud of of that sustainability credential really mm, no it's a wonderful catalog there's so much online as well that isn't in the catalog that we would mention if we've got more time i know um, yeah. but well done it's beautiful thank you arthur so lovely to talk and talk to you very soon bye Thanks so much for listening to me and Arthur chatting away again about our favourite things to plant now for flowering next spring and summer. Next week, I'm back on my own and I am going to tell you the things that I am sowing now to eat all the way through the winter and into the spring. So it's the best things for autumn sowing to eat for the next six months of the year. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.